Uh, he's also worked on, on brand campaigns for the likes of YouTube, American Express, Epson, King's Hawaiian Bread, and, AA, and AARP. Please welcome Brian Betker. Thank you. Um, so I have my questions and notes on my phone. I'm not checking email while moderating, don't worry. But the other reason for the phone is I'll attempt to check out the Twitter feed while we're doing the panel. So if anyone has like a follow-up question or something that they didn't understand or whatnot, feel free to do it with the hashtag and I'll try to um, kind of filter it in as we're doing the panel and whatnot as well. Um, so we obviously did the panel prep like everyone does and it became pretty apparent that everyone does real-time marketing, everyone believes it's necessary, so um, kind of tweaking a little bit from how real-time do you need to be to how do you be real-time and what does that mean? Um, and we're looking at this from the standpoint of real-time versus topical. So the example we gave was Christmas might be a topical thing that you plan for, but real-time might be if a gang of bad Santas robbed a bank, you know, that would be a real-time opportunity to tweet or post on that. So that's kind of the, the lens and filter upon which we're tackling this. So, so what we'll do is we'll go down and if everyone can introduce themselves and uh, also give your definition of real-time since different people define it different ways um, of what it means to you. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. My name is Scott Carlos. I am the Vice President of Digital and Social Media for AEG Global Partnerships. For those who don't know AEG, it is not the insurance conglomerate, which I had to remind my mother that is the case. She thought I had switched from media to selling insurance, and I had to you know, talk her off the ledge and remind her that there was some sort of kind of synergy between what I was doing now. AEG is the largest sports entertainment company in the world. We, a um, little backdrop for you, a little overview. We are the largest owner of sports teams, including six in the United States, which includes uh, the defending Stanley Cup champion, probably this little ephemeral title at this point, of the LA Kings. We are the two-time defending well, owners of the two-time defending owners of uh, LA Galaxy, as well as the Houston Dynamo. Uh, five teams in Europe, including the Edmonton Oilers of the 80s, which is like the Hamburg Freezers, as well as four other kind of uh, European teams. We are the second largest concert promoter in the world. We promote uh, acts like Justin Bieber and Kenny Chesney and Taylor Swift and the Rolling Stones. We produce over 7,000 concerts worldwide. We are the number one owner of festivals in the world, and I believe you don't know Golden Voice or perhaps some of the other festival names like uh, Coachella and New Orleans Jazz and Heritage. We also own and operate 100 uh, facilities worldwide, including the Staples Center, Nokia Theater Club, Nokia, the O2 in London, which is the number one concert venue in the world. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a backdrop. We like to call it the hardware and the software of the company, the hardware is the facilities, and the software is the content, like the kings and the concerts and the shows and the events. I oversee uh, digital and social for global partnerships, and global partnerships is essentially the sponsorships and sales and servicing and activation for all of our sponsorships worldwide for our global partners. And my role increasingly is playing a role in terms of creating interactive experiences for all of our partners. They want much more than just the notion of outdoor sort of kind of billboards where, you just, where you're just manicuring the lawn underneath the outdoor signage. Today, interactive has a much different sort of meaning, and it's really creating those sort of two-way conversations, deeper connections, developing communities that the brands can participate through multiple sort of digital touch points. Uh, hi, I I'm Denise Humphrey. Oh, would you like to talk about? No, I said that's all I got. Okay. <laughs> uh, Denise Humphreys, I work for the PGA Tour. Uh, I work. Oh, oh, I do need to say what real time marketing is. That's is that what I right? Thought. Okay. Right. Uh, very simply, real time marketing to us, I think, means uh, marketing at the speed of culture and really kind of being plugged in and, and understanding and monitoring what's happening in real time and how it's applicable to our brands and our teams and creating programs on the spot and on the time. Uh, Denise Humphreys, again, I work for the PGA Tour. Uh, I run several of our digital businesses. Um, I run video games, uh, satellite radio, um, our e-commerce uh, company, and I also run our email marketing and all of our digital marketing for our website. Um, I believe uh, real-time marketing, and we've had several discussions on this, uh, I believe it's, it's being able to react to situations as they happen. Um, and, and expand on them and, and make them benefit your company. Um, I think that's all I have. 
Uh, hi, I'm Bill McKevney. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Brand Development at Conversation uh, in New York. We are a fully integrated marketing services firm. Um, work very heavily in the interactive space, um, which includes you know, digital, social, mobile. Um, I am really responsible for uh, ensuring that there's alignment between you know our research strategy, creative teams, to making sure to make sure that everything is sort of aligned with the business objectives of our client, uh, and making sure that it's executed um, smoothly. Um, from my perspective, I was actually really heartened to hear Steve say, um, you know, th this sort of key key point of uh, of humanizing the brands, because um, I think that really uh, sort of uh, is at the the core of what real time marketing will be, um, and and sort of where where I see a brand should aspire to is, is really leveraging. Um, all of this new information we have about our customers, about the demographics, and ensuring that we can again create that that sort of human touch, that personalized relationship where you're where you're actually providing value uh, to them on a constant basis. And I think that uh, I think it's a, it's a pretty exciting time, and and looking forward to seeing you know getting everybody else's perspectives on that. Hi everybody, my name is Caitlin Moyer. I'm the Senior Manager of Advertising and Marketing for the Milwaukee Brewers. So just wanted to say welcome to my home state. And um, the Brewers are in town this weekend. So if you're making your way back to Milwaukee, I invite you to check out Miller Park. Um, that is kind of a real-time marketing um, plug right there. <laughs> um, to me, real-time marketing with sports, it's kind of different. I think you're always real-time. You're always updating scores. Something's always happening in the game. You never know what the outcome is going to be. Um, but beside that, it's it's really listening into the conversation, figuring out ways you can insert your brand um, into what's going on or listening to your customers for their feedback or their concerns. Hello, my name is Tom O'Keefe uh, with an ad agency, O'Keefe, Reinhard, and Paul, that uh, I started with two partners about three months ago. Um, and for the very reason, I think, of being much more able to do real time. I and mean, one of our key principles is be nimble, be quick, be prolific, because uh, we felt the need to be able to really engage in this conversation. Prior to that, I was North American Creative Director for Draft FCB. Um, work closely with both Oreo and extremely closely with um, Taco Bell, two brands that I think are, are doing a great job from a social media and real-time standpoint. Um, I'm also heartened by the human analogy of real-time because I think what I sent to Brian was something along the lines of I think real-time is defined by the demanufacturing or manufacturization of brands and their communication, meaning um, consumers, you know, they don't want to feel like whatever the message is has been put on a shelf that needs to be queued up over a period of time and then when it launches, this was all some kind of master plan that, you know, has had months in the works. But to be able to, to uh, kind of be more vulnerable and spontaneous and make it feel like we're part of a conversation happening today. The difference being, you know, consumers don't want to be engaged in a conversation that's started by brands. They want brands that can engage in conversations that they've started. And I think the ability to respond in real time is the definition of that. Cool. Thank you. Um, so we're already getting activity from the audience. They said we might need a little coffee to wake up. And apparently, you have the coolest holding company in the world. So, um, so let's talk I a agree. little bit about, about process, um, early in the morning process. But um, you know, Steve mentioned that real-time marketing takes a lot of planning. Like You have to have your ducks in a row and whatnot. So what, what would you say is one piece of documentation or processy or training for your staff like what's sort of that that keystone thing that you have to have or a keystone thing in order to make sure that you're prepped and ready to capitalize on real time marketing and why don't we start with you and come back to the swings so i think it, i think if i could i would go bigger than just a process i think it's about a kind of an ethos or a culture of an organization that allows you to respond real time and that i think is removing process um, because the brands that are doing it well they've got somebody who's willing to make a call and do something quickly and if you've got too much process you know if you become a bureaucracy you're just not going to be able to do that so the experiences that I've had with with brands that have done a good job it's because somebody getting back to that human connection again is willing to kind of stick their neck out and do something quickly and do it in a way where you know it gets to the top or whoever has to make that call. So I would say number one, have somebody who's at the top who's going to be willing to make a call when you've got to go respond to something that's happening real time. Something that I live by is our editorial calendar. So um, it's that junction of 
planning and preparedness. So we're planning, we, so if you plan ahead and get ahead of certain things that you know are going to come up, for instance, in our case, player milestones. We've got a player who's one save away from a milestone of 300 saves. So we have a graphic ready to go. That's not taking us by surprise. That frees us up to look at something, some other opportunities that might come up. Also, I think uh, listening tools are, are huge. Um, from the perspective of sort of the agency world and the clients that we work with and uh, essentially manage and create a lot of their social strategy, I think one, I think it's a good point to the sort of uh, organizational change that you need to have at the top to be able to look at it holistically and not have those pro like bureaucratic processes in place that sort of stymie that the ability to, to, yep. to respond in real time. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, what we try and do for, for our clients is around our client services team to create um, uh, become thought leaders in their in their respective industries and the clients that they're covering. So every uh, Monday we send out to the to the uh, to the agency sort of an industry insights weekly based off of um, our clients for whom we manage the properties and essentially uh, talk about what's going on in the industry, uh, any current events, anything that may have been taking place prior, things that may be coming up, um, what's going on with the company, and then three of their competitors. So um, we sort of on a weekly basis have that base of knowledge that we can sort of use to react to in a you know in a current sort of current fashion. Uh, I think for us, it's really the collaboration between communications, editorial, and our marketing staff. Um, we are lucky enough to know when our events are going on, and we're lucky enough to have a large editorial staff. So in addition to posting, they're monitoring um, all of our feeds, and they're ready to react. So we can talk to the communications team and figure out how to react to that, whether it's just tweets back, whether it's reposting, or whether it's creating a, a larger communication strategy across all the, the channels. Uh, very similar to, to what Kristen was saying is that what's probably critical, most critical to us is that calendar. Um, for the sports teams, for the Kings, or for the Galaxy, for the Dynamo, as well as all the different live events that are happening and concerts and shows and performance and tours that are coming to our area, it's critical for us to kind of have that sort of kind of template and, and understanding in terms of how we can develop strategically for the brands that are already powering or sponsoring and want those deeper connections. So then it's working tactically to kind of come up with those executions based on things that are bubbling up in culture you know, at that time. So three of you mentioned something that's kind of in the category of esprit de corps or like um, you know, leadership or things like that. Um, and I'm sure that applies to everyone on the panel. Is, is that something that you can change within an organization or you know, convince someone of? Or is it something that you have to hire and get people in um, that already have that sense of togetherness or wanting to do that or real time or whatnot and throw that out to all of you. Uh, just to, I, I think it starts with the brand itself. You know, the brand, a, a brand, you can't just do it overnight. You know, if you flip a switch and you start responding real time or whatever, you know, we're talking about here, it, it'll come off as false or no one's going to pick up on it. The brand's core essence has to have something in it that will allow this to be you know, an, a, an outlet, a channel. Um, and if you have the brand that has that belief, that brand should also have the, the people in place who are going to be able to, you know, uh, pr promote that. And if not, then the whole thing's going to be out of whack and there's not going to be, you know, social media is the least of your problems. I definitely agree. To your point, you really just can't flip a switch. You have to be committed to go for it because once you start responding in real time, people just expect you to do that. And once you stray from that, you're going to hear about it. So I definitely think you have to have that commitment and I think um, and proven trust too. So, so for maybe some of the brands that are in the audience that haven't done a lot of real time um, and are kind of towing the waters but not sure, do you all recommend staying away from it until you're truly ready or do you think it is something that you should just dive into the deep end and start trying to swim? Well, I think, um, uh, personally, I think, I think you have to look at what your organization looks like internally. Uh, and if you are, um, you know, if, if management looks at things in a siloed fashion and sort of by tactics and that's sort of what that overlying strategy looks like from a holistic perspective, um, it may not be a good idea to, to jump into sort of real-time marketing, if you will. 
Um, you know, it, it also maybe it's also interesting to see you know what when the time might be right to to do that. If you look at certain industries, for example, um, something like the insurance space, which was you know traditionally B two B, where you know, the insurance providers really uh, sort of communicated with employers and the agents who brokered the deals on behalf of the policyholders or the employees. Uh, but now with this sort of shift towards patients taking more control of their health, um, you know, consuming more information digitally, um, it's become a much more of a, a B two C type of focus. So you have the ability and the opportunity to really sort of make that 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 paradigm shift uh, from an internal as an internal company to to break down those silos and and create a, a, an experience and then a, a way to communicate real time by you know again looking at things from that holistic perspective and, and aligning internally. Everybody should everybody should be in it. I think the question is, do you know what your brand's voice is before you get into it? Because what you're going to start to say and how you're going to communicate needs to be true to what your brand's core essence is. And it's not the what you say, it's how you say it. So you know, if you have a great understanding of what the brand's voice and essence is, then what you're going to go do and how you're going to get out there with reaction to things going on should be true to that. The, I think what could be the watch out, and we've seen this happen before, is where it just kind of takes on this de facto generic voice that you're trying to get into a conversation. It's not going to stick because it's not true to really what the core of the brand is, you know, and it's just reacting for the sake of reacting. And then you're going to run into trouble because, you know, you're undoing what the brand at the end of the day is really all about. So I think that's the first step is understanding your brand's voice and then saying, well, how do we now start to step out in a much more real time, by the minute, you know, way using that voice as, you know, our guide? Yeah. yeah, I agree in terms of you need to be careful of not just checking boxes on your marketing to-do list. You know, we need a social program. We need to send out some tweets. We need to have an Instagram. You have to understand what your value, core, core value proposition of your brand is. And most importantly, when you're talking about real-time marketing, it really is about relevance. How are you being, how can you be relevant to connect to your, to your customer base and allow them to have those sort of, well, at, at least in our business, you know, not simply activate on marks anymore, you know, your, your sponsorships, not just kind of logo lock-ins, but how do you create these live experiences? How do you create experiential sort of programs and platforms for your customers or your fans to engage with? And that is most critical. It can't be forced. And we talk about authenticity and we talk about organic sort of integrations. As much as we kind of bandy it about and it almost seems trite, it's absolutely critical because customers and, and today's consumer will sniff it out. If it feels organic and you still know it's a branded proposition, but it actually is cool and it's something you want to engage with, well then that's the win. And working in sports and, and music, we arguably reach a very group, a very passionate group of constituents, right? I mean, people who already want to engage, and now you're giving them the platform. You're giving them a, an opportunity to develop the sort of kind of communi communicative, community relation, community oriented sort of um, platforms to hear the, have their voice heard. Just a, two quick examples. I think one, and I mentioned Taco Bell and Oreo. So Taco Bell has been real-time social media before there was such a thing. Going back to you know putting targets in the ocean for satellites to fall into and Barry Bonds and McCovey's Cove and all of that. Reacting real-time but doing it in a way that wasn't really social. So for them to be doing what they're doing now makes complete sense and it's been there you know, it's been part of their essence for years. Oreo was, you know, a traditional cookie for a long time, and then in the last year, they decided to celebrate their 100th anniversary by getting into a conversation on a daily basis. They had a daily twist campaign that ran last summer. That, I believe, had a lot to do with the acceptance of them being able to do what they did to the Super Bowl, because suddenly they were a brand that was no longer grandma's cookie. They were a brand that had done this thing, that had gotten into the conversation, had actually hit some controversial points, and when the thing at the Super Bowl happened this year, they struck. Now, had they not done that prior to it, it would have been like, what's Oreo doing getting in a conversation here about the lights going dark? <laughs> so I think you can make it happen quick, but you still got to kind of take that first step to do it. So on that topic, and that kind of ties into the keynote yesterday where we looked at the, uh, the example of Tide versus Oreo and how they both had the lights went dark, but one goes off and one doesn't sort of yeah. thing, which ties in, I think, pretty closely to what you're saying. Yeah. So how do you monitor, and throw this out for, for all of you, how do you monitor for real-time opportunities that are right for your brand, for your company? You know, is it, do you have any tricks of the trade, like alerts that you have set up, or certain news outlets you monitor? What, what do you do to kind of empower yourselves to find those opportunities? Or is it just kismet? 
<laughs> I, I think we really listen to our fans, and it might be a little easier for us because they're looking for you know something different, something cool that happens, something unusual. Um, and we have a team set up. We have our editorial teams looking at it all the time. And a uh, perfect example is um, Sergio hit the ball out of a tree, and it's not something we would have predicted, and it's not something you're even sure if anybody cares about. But all of a sudden, our Twitter feeds and our Facebook started blowing up with everybody saying, did you see that shot? That was amazing. And everybody started clipping it, so we took the video, posted it to YouTube, and got 300,000 views in a number of minutes because we were there and we had the staff to do it. Um, it certainly wasn't anything we could have predicted, but you just have to run with it and then make sure that you're, you're spreading it out across the channels. I mean, from the perspective of our clients, we again we have our we have the client services team really uh, become thought leaders and, and experts, industry experts on their on their clients and where they operate. And I think uh, you know for for us, it, it's very much a, a human touch. So when we our client services team will monitor in real time and 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 doesn't we don't necessarily use tools like Hootsuite to to figure out when the, the to post things in sort of a, uh, you know an automated fashion and allows you to really be a little bit more proactive on what's relevant, what's appropriate content, um, and being able to do that and being empowered to do that. Really means you have to have a very deep understanding of the brand, who you're working with in the industry, and, and also have that long-standing relationship and that trust in order to, you know, be empowered to be able to do something like that. Yeah, we definitely monitor the conversations. Um, we have a number of different searches um, saved in a dashboard, looking at those on a constant basis, and they allow us to do um, a lot, of, a number of different things. One program that we brought from the ballpark um, to the online realm is something we call Brewers Fans First. Um, it's not something that we publicize necessarily, but um, front office staff take a turn every game we have an armload of stuff, whether it's ticket upgrades, um, on-field passes to view batting practice, food and concession vouchers, and we wander the ballpark and we look for deserving fans and we surprise them. And most of the times they're like, whoa, are you sure? What's the cost? No, no, we really just want to move your, you down to the first row. Um, so it just seemed like a natural transition to bring that to social media. So looking for fans that are talking about us, talking about a favorite player, um, and then just surprising them. You, you're mentioning that you can't wait for Corey Hart to get back from the DL. Well, we can't wait either, but here's a, here's a baseball. Um, so those kind of things. Um, also, you can, if you're monitoring real time, you can act on um, situations like Denise mentioned. Being reactive is also part of uh, real time marketing. So something as simple as we had an incident where people were tweeting, not necessarily at us, but about a dog being locked in a car in the parking lot on a hundred degree day, um, and people are you know calling the human or writing it to the human Humane Society, well, contact the stadium um, control group. They went out in the parking lots. They found the vehicle. They paged the owner of the vehicle and asked him to remove his dog from the property. So not necessarily marketing, but to show people, hey, we are paying attention. We're listening. We're here. Don't worry about the dog. He's safe. Enjoy the game. Thank you for saving the dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think one of the interesting things just to insert quickly the thing about surprise and delight is nice because then you don't have to worry about like contest rules and things yes. like that you can yeah. just give people stuff <laughs> absolutely makes um, you feel like santa <laughs> yeah so the other side of the coin um of you know there's all the good things and all the surprise and delight the other side is you're kind of opening yourself up for risk by doing real-time marketing right like is it right for your brand are you going to be judged by what you say um you know how do you how do you prep for that? Is there any, who's responsible, you know? Is it, is it the CMO? Is it the person who did the tweet? Um, and then maybe also from some of you that work in the sports properties, we talked a little bit about how you're not just managing your own stuff, but having to kind of de facto represent all these players that you really don't represent, but you do. <laughs> um, how, do you, how do you manage that? And maybe some advice for people on, um, dealing with the risk factors associated. So, uh, I'll start with this one. Um, we have uh, not just uh, hundreds of players on all of our tours. We have tournaments. We have um, so many entities tweeting, including, uh, including some of our partners. And we were discussing earlier that um, it's really everybody in our organization's job to, to monitor what's going on with our brand and, and what people are talking about. 
um, I had received a call from someone that said, um, we need help, we need to get this tweet down. And you know, I don't normally like to suppress what's out there. We normally like to, to, to run with it. And they sent me a tweet, and it was from our video game partner, who, uh, again, may have some different standards of what, what they tweet. Um, but it talked about uh, our incident with uh, VJ Singh, and it said, uh, we need to add deer antler spray in the game as a power-up. And he thought it was funny and tweeted it out and you know, copied a, a ton of people. And I had to call him and say, um, funny, funny joke, <laughs> but you have our marks on your photo in your Twitter feed and you need to take your tweet down. And so, uh, you know, w one part of me says, you know, it's great. I want people to be talking about us, but we also can't have our brand associated with things like that. Uh, you know, we're, we're a players association, and we need to make sure that our players are being taken care of. So I think it's everyone's job to make sure we're monitoring everything. And if you see something that doesn't look right, you really have to stand up and do something. So in that situation, if, if his Twitter icon hadn't have had your mark in it, would it have been okay, or is that like where do you draw the it line? It wouldn't have been okay, but I I don't think we would have stopped him from doing it. Okay. Um, if his um, if he was a tour employee, he would have been fired. Oh really? Yeah. Okay, and so how do you how do you inform people like how do they know that that's the case? We we have a policy. Okay. Um, and so if you are um, working on behalf of the tour, uh, you have to there's a, a list of standards that you have to follow. Okay, and so what? What type of standard would that fall under that would be a fireable offense? Um, and any derogatory comments about uh, the tour or players? Okay. Which which that I guess right. falls. <laughs> if it feels offensive, you might. <laughs> if you have if, to if, ask, if, it's wrong. Exactly. <laughs> if it feels offensive, probably in your best interest not to post. But um, you know, from a from a team and fan perspective, we really try to look at it from the what's best for the fans. We're all fans, you know, everyone likes sports, everyone likes music. What's gonna seem to, you know, generate the highest level of sort of immersion and, 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 uh, and engagement and also want to be shared with, with like-minded fans. So we kind of take it from that perspective. And since we represent the brands, you know, brands, have, uh, I, I would submit, have, are actually quite smart in terms of how they want to be integrated with it. They don't want just some sort of force control messaging. They just want to feel as though they're being integrated into something that has some real substance, some real sort of excitement that they are powering or, or, or producing that provides greater engagement for fans and customers. So um, if we kind of can meet the needs of all those key constituencies between the team, between the fans, and from the brands that are powering or subsidizing a lot of these initiatives, then it's a win-win for us. We also have a social media policy, and, and another issue besides those types of things is tampering and um, giving out information before it's official. So, you know, part of that is, let's say I'm leaving after work after a game, and I see a player leaving the locker room on crutches. I can't just take a picture of that and, <laughs> and tweet it out. Um, that's privileged information that I wouldn't have gained had I not been working there. So that's something to be aware of. Um, there's a situation with the Atlanta Hawks right now. I don't know how many of you are following that, but um, one of the ticket reps just sent out an innocent email, I don't know all the facts of the case, but an innocent email saying, hey, you know, free agency is coming up, um, you know, we might be getting guys like X and X, whoops, um, now they're facing a fine, a potential fine for that because that is considered tampering, even though, you know, the, the ticket hold, or the ticket rep probably had no clue, he's not privy to those um, operations talks, but it's something you just have to monitor and, and be aware of. <laughs> but to Kristen's point, though, the, um, about, Kate, uh, Caitlin, Caitlin, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> To Caitlin's point, uh, is the behind-the-scenes sort of uh, information is, and, you know, whether it's through uh, Vine videos or it's through Instagram feeds, those are arguably some of the most kind of, um, those fuel the most passion, it seems, among our, our fans. Well, and, and I do say, um, we do behind the scenes, but, but not in a negative way. Um, so we will take pictures of players with their family or, you know, a, a little child hugging their, their dad and posting it saying, you know, he's taking a break from the course. This is what he does in his time off. Um, they're always aware of that, though. We're not posting it and just running off and doing it. And it's got to be the people that are authorized to do yes. that, I think, is the key. If it was just like a season ticket rep and they just felt like tweeting that out, that's one thing. But if it's we have you know permission, this is part of our plan. We can proceed. I think on the sports side, anything to do with competition is usually off limits if it's if it's unauthorized. Mm -hmm. So do you monitor um, and going beyond the sports side? I mean, for the agencies as well, do you monitor everyone involved with your brand 
you know, do you do you monitor all employees to check on that, or is it just a, if you find out, you bring down the hammer? Um, yeah, I get a, I get a text every time one of our players tweets. It's kind of annoying, but um, I'm just keeping up with it and see if there's a potential problem. Um, we had an incident where even the sister of a player um, was tweeting something that she shouldn't have been doing, and you know you can't you can't follow every girlfriend, wife, whatever. Um, but happened to see that happened to, you know, kind of could have caused an issue. Luckily, we caught it beforehand and um, were able to bring it to their attention. So it is it is a lot of, of time monitoring that, those types of things. I mean, we're a lot smaller than the Milwaukee Brewers, so we just, uh, um, we actually have kind of, the, we have a brand voice for the agency. I'm talking about the agency, not necessarily client right now, okay. but we, um, and that brand voice is this combination of what we call whiskey and bananas, part cool and part funny. And we've got Second City writers who are on staff who come in and kind of do a lot of our tweeting. Um, and anybody else who wanted to kind of tweet has to, we monitor to a point. And once they've kind of shown that they understand that tone and that voice, we let them off on their own as long as it's, you know, from our, from our standard tweet. And I would say the same thing about our clients, you know, it's, it's the ability, again, to know what the essence of that voice of that brand is. And once you do, and once you understand it and can assume it, then you should be off and running. If not, somebody should be monitoring it because it's very, very important. And one gets out in the wrong way, in the wrong place, and you know there's reverberation disaster, so. I mean, for the perspective of, of our of the clients we we manage the social their social media practices, we uh, I think we really we do monitor quite a bit, but we look at it. Uh, you know, we, we get an understanding of sort of what the limits are based on their industry. Um, you know, for example, uh, Avino has uh, some strict re regulatory requirements that that may change sort of the limits and and sort of what their comfort level is in terms of what they can post. Um, so we make sure we have a sort of a, a good understanding and, a, and an alignment there. And then and then obviously we are monitoring that in real time. So um, understanding. Who, if it is potential employees that may be, you know, putting something that is egregious and, uh, you know, against the brand, against their customer demographic, you know, we'll we'll certainly report that back to make sure that the right steps are taken. Uh, but it's definitely sort of a, a not a one size fits all approach. We really have to just see sort of what the what the comfort level is based on the company's culture, based on their strategies, and what they're trying to achieve. So we've pretty much only talked about social media. Do we do a disservice as experts in our field by? focusing real time on social media like i mean you spoke a little bit in your definition about that idea of you know no silos and whatnot like just what's your general opinion on is real time just social or is it too complicated to refer to it as something other than social well, I think people revert back to social because it really is the the, the truest sort of two-way uh, dialogue between a, a consumer and, and the brand. But I don't think I, I don't think we can sort of limit it to that. Um, a really interesting example uh, of uh, you know of, of sort of real time and, and a very successful campaign was um, Fathead. I know I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Fathead, but they make the uh, sort of the life-size posters of of athletes, and um, they, uh, they had accidentally shipped a Tim Tebow poster to someone who had ordered a Tom Brady poster. Now, I can understand that's an honest mistake given their equally skill, uh, skilled <laughs> quarterbacks, but um, what happened was the, uh, the disgruntled customer went on Reddit and uh, started complaining and this uh, created a bit of a firestorm and a bit of a PR nightmare for Fathead. Um, so uh, Fathead was really smart in looking at this more of, of an opportunity to sort of right the wrong but, but also capitalize on uh, some of the attention it was getting. And uh, what they did was partner with Reddit um, to sort of make light of the situation, apologize, make fun of themselves a little bit, and then um, offer a 25% uh, off to anybody who had seen uh, seen the ad through Reddit. And uh, and and what happened was it, it generated you know a tremendous amount of awareness, engagement with the brand, fostered a lot of goodwill, um, and and was extremely successful from you know from a monetary perspective. So it was a great way to, uh, to sort of take that uh, what could be a potential pitfall and turn it into something and, and spin gold with it essentially. I think there are potentials um, definitely beyond social. We talked about social mobile TV. One thing that we've been trying to do is during our game broadcast, you know, the broadcasters do drop-ins about you know upcoming giveaway nights and things like that. So following along with that, especially when we're on the road, um, you know, 
hey, you just heard Bill mention that cap night. Here's the link to that cap. So now they're seeing it in two places if they're following us on Twitter and watching the game. That's kind of that advertiser's dream. They're driving by your billboard. They hear your radio spot at the same time. Um, also, speaking of billboards, um, they're actually one of the most nimble, the, the digital auto home, that's one of the most nimble resources that we have. Um, if we have messages running, within minutes we can change out the creative. Um, they have like, the if-then kind of conditional things that we can run. Um, they've just been great for us. So any questions from the audience at all? No? We're covering are you, it that Are you measuring well. success on any of these? Are there any metrics against which to, to measure or to gauge whether you're having an impact or, or whether it's the impact that you want or whether there's actually some sort of ROI attached to being, uh, being engaged in real-time conversations? Um, from our standpoint, um, we're actually fortunate because we can monit uh, monitor and track ticket sales success. So there's been some things that we've done real time. We've done some one day only sales where the only place that we advertise um, is through the different platforms. So if you're following us on Twitter, you may get one coupon code. If you're following us on Facebook, you may get another. Um, the direct tracking links. And in one day, we've sold 20,000 tickets. Um, through those offers, so we can really monetize in that way, um, real-time marketing. It seems like a social media, and again, we're going back to social media. Sorry, but the real-time um, is uh, is an ROI. You know, I mean, it was always the thing about digital, right? Well, how can I track the ROI on my digital? How can because it was a, it, it was a slower build. It wasn't anything immediate. But with, with social media, I mean, it all comes down to sales if you're a brand, right, at the end of the day. And I think a lot of brands are seeing, you know, both the positive and unfortunately the negative of what can happen at the bottom line, you know, based on um, what's out there, what the conversations are about their brand or what incident or, you know, positive or negative has happened overnight. Um, so I think ROI, whether anyone's actually quantifying it directly yet or not, I think everybody feels that there is an ROI associated with, you know, what real-time marketing and social media have been able to kind of bring to the table. So is that an ROI or is that that there's a cost to do business, like in an entry fee, if you will, and then you have the opportunity to win on top of that, you know? Yeah, because, I mean, what is the investment? I don't know. I mean, in many cases, it's, you know, it's just... It's happenstance. Um, so it's really just, yeah, go in and hopefully that there's a benefit on the end that's, that's a positive. Well, and in our case on the social side, um, we're tracking reach. So for our website, that's fairly important. So while there may not be uh, monetary advance, uh, advantages to that, um, we can definitely see the reach that we gain from it, so. Yeah. And, you know, first regarding I would submit regarding, you know, real time doesn't need to be social, not necessarily. Um, I think what the advantages and benefits of social, obviously, is that it's much more viral and the, the velocity behind getting that message out is just a lot faster as a result because everything can be shared. In terms of the metrics behind it, when you do these real time sort of kind of marketing campaigns or just digital campaigns in general, you know, there's a multitude of ways that you can kind of measure and show that level of success hopefully, in that campaign that you launch, and that's through, you know, the number of Instagram photos that are sent, the number of tweets that are, that are retweeted, the, uh, the, the press pickup that is, that is generated, and the buzz impressions that because you did a, you know, a, a really cool, a smart campaign. There's a multitude of ways that you can kind of evaluate, you know, assess that, that, that level of um, immediacy behind that campaign. That just creates an, an additional sort of, you know, trigger of, of, of fan engagement and excitement around a program. So, to me, those are measures of success. You know, a lot of times on the digital side of what we do, we look to our PR counterparts to look at how did they measure their worth you know, in the sphere and then kind of apply the same thing. But, um, so we have a bunch of sports entities on the panel. And by the nature of sports, it's real time, right? Like you're constantly having real time activities going on. So you guys have almost been forced to get into the mix through all that. Do you think there's anything that sports is doing related to real time that brands are behind the curve on or that, or you guys are just ahead of the curve that everyone should kind of be picking up on as a best practice? I think it's a little easier for us because it's contained into a certain time frame. So you're not just waiting for something to happen or trying to figure out when to plan something. You know, we know there's going to be a winner on Sunday. We may not know who the player is or who the sponsor is, but we can be ready. And if Tiger wins, say, go buy Tiger's red shirt. 
um, it, it's not that hard to figure out the combinations. So I think we're at a little bit of an advantage. Um, I, I'm not sure how applicable that is, but I think if you look at milestones or, or some kind of tempos in your brand, you could probably find some places where it might make sense. A couple of things that I, I was thinking about, um, a lot of teams are trying out these social reward um, and affinity programs, so that's something that all brands could um, potentially look into. Another thing we focus in on is year-round relevancy, so we're playing for six months of the year, but we don't want our fans to forget about us the rest of the year, so I know a lot of brands have seasonality, but that doesn't mean that you have to be quiet or, or go dormant. Um, also, with in-stadium engagement, it doesn't apply quite as well, but maybe think about you know how you can translate it to your bricks and mortar um, places. Um, once you're in our ballpark, we have an app that you can download. Um, it can tell you everything from where to find that bacon wrapped hot dog, yes I said bacon, and <laughs> um, to what music is playing when a player goes up to bat. Um, you can play games against people in other sections. We have um, people tweeting in where are your tweet seats, so where are you watching the game from? We might surprise you at your seat with something. Um, we're asking questions that people can engage with us on the scoreboard and then to the extremes. I um, don't know how many of you guys saw, but the Giants uh, this week launched their social cafe. So it's actually like a coffee shop within the ballpark where there's this huge tweet deck on a touchscreen TV. They're monitoring conversation. People's Instagram photos are being broadcast. Um, there's a number of clubs that have social suites now. So how can you bring the social experience to your location? Yeah, I think Steve's about to give us the hook, so if you had something, you better say it fast. <laughs> Did you have something? No. no, to what they said. Here, here. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I think we're out of time, right? Yep. Okay. There we go. Thanks. Thank you. Brian, thank you. Panel, thanks very much. There's, there's, some, there's something curiously um, old about uh, this idea of, of a brand with a personality. Because after all, the mascot, the, the brand mascot has